Hello and welcome everyone to uh, this evening's Thinking, which is all about the chip crisis. And I'm delighted uh, to be able to say that we're hosting this in partnership with Huawei. Um, I'm Alexi Mostris, I'm an editor and partner uh, at Tortoise. Um, we've been thinking quite a lot uh, at Tortoise about uh, the future uh, of technology, what, what technology is going to look like in uh, 10 years time. And we're, we're going to do an, an event at, at London Tech Week that, that asks uh, that, that very question. But actually, uh, if you really want to see the future uh, of tech, all you have to do is go on YouTube and watch a video uh, from this year about uh, the flagship factory of a company called TSMC, uh, which is the most important maker of uh, silicon chips uh, in the world today. Uh, it's got the most expensive factory uh, ever made. And some of the stuff that it does is uh, obviously like out of a sci-fi movie. Um, the company is working currently on chip components that are so small that they are known by engineers as two-dimensional objects because that is essentially what they are. Uh, but uh, TSMC's supply chain and the supply chain of other chip manufacturers uh, is uh, under threat. Uh, and the consequences of that uh, could be huge. And, and that's what we'll talk about during uh, this discussion. Uh, but it's clear that uh, this is not just a business problem. Uh, it's a geopolitical one as well. Uh, American sanctions have limited Chinese access to these super important chips, exacerbating the tensions between the superpowers, especially in Taiwan, uh, the home of TSMC, where uh, many would argue that uh, there's enough tension already. So to discuss all this, whether we're talking about a couple of months delay uh, to your PS5 order or the next geopolitical crisis, uh, we're joined by four experts. Uh, Jeremy Thompson, uh, heads up Huawei uh, in the UK. Um, Daphne uh, Le Prince Rango, I'm, I'm so sorry, I've definitely mispronounced that, is a technology reporter at, at, at ZDNet. Uh, Rana Mitter is Professor uh, of History and Politics of Modern China at the University of Oxford. Uh, and Professor uh, Zhou Xian Ung is Professor of Semiconductor Devices uh, at the University of Sheffield. Thanks so much everyone for, for coming. Uh, just before we get involved in the discussion, I should say uh, that for everyone, for anyone who hasn't been to a thinking before, um, basically we want to hear what, what you have to say. This isn't a panel discussion, despite the brilliance uh, of the panelists. Uh, it really works well when you come onto the chat or raise your, your Zoom hand uh, and tell us about your experiences. Maybe you're uh, involved in the manufacture of chips or uh, you use chips or you have a view on, on how uh, the governments uh, of the world should be handling uh, this crisis. We really, really want to hear your points of view. So uh, please write them in the chat. My colleague Seb is, is hosting the chat or put your, put your Zoom hand up and we will try and bring you uh, into uh, the debate. Um, I should also say lastly that uh, because I've been told to self-isolate as a result of my NHS app, this thinking is being hosted uh, from my house rather than from my office. Uh, so any screaming kids uh, or internet failures are, are because of that and that alone. Okay, uh, let's let's start. Professor uh, um, Joe, um, can, can I come to you first? C can you tell us a little bit about you know, what a chip actually is. Uh, why are they so central to all our lives? Um, so really the chip is now so ubiquitous. We really stopped thinking about them. We, we, we've been taking them for granted. Um, you want to get a phone for your child, might be 12 years, getting into secondary school, you don't get a very basic phone, you get a smartphone. And in there is all these complicated, really complicated uh, semiconductor devices really very, very small and um, huge amount of them. I'm not going to say how many billions because I always get it wrong. Um, but the latest, latest one uh, that IBM is now seeing probably rolling off the, uh, the lab in a few years time, something like 50 billion transistor in the size of your a fingernail. It's ridiculous amount. You need all these chips to do all the things that we want really fast, really quickly. We don't want to wait a second for a video to load and things like that. And we need all the computing uh, equipment for uh, hybrid working. Um, so it's just everywhere. It's there in your uh, cars. 
the modern cars has much more electronic uh, components than even 10 years ago, and it's going to be fully electric um, if it all goes well. So it's just more and more demands, really. We can't live without them. And, and can, you, can you say a couple of things about uh, Moore's law, which is, I think, very relevant to the, the manufacturer uh, the manufacture of, of chips? And, and also, you, you touched on it before, but there's a very interesting progression, isn't there, from these chips, which were originally known as computer chips, that's what we called them, to now just being chips because they're literally in everything. Yeah. Um, so I think the, the Moore's law is um, something a lot of people have paid a lot of attention to because it's talking about, uh, it's not really a law. It was really just an empirical uh, observation and um, just saying that the, you know, the density of, of the, uh, the number of transistors, which is like the little building blocks, think of them like Lego blocks if you want to build big stuff. That density is, is I think it's doubling every, uh, Sorry, I forgot how many years. Can someone help me out, Jeremy? A couple of years, I think, maybe. A couple of years. Um, would you know the exact number? Two. Two years? Two. All right, OK. Yeah. Um, but actually, uh, that was well uh, for the first of the flight, two decades or so. Uh, you just keep shrinking this transistor, which is a building block. But it still keeps giving you the good performance. So all was well. You squeeze it more. and. Uh, the chip gets smaller and smaller, which has a lot of benefits. Uh, there's a lot of reduced power consumption, which comes with this. So it wasn't just like making things smaller for the sake of it. There was real, real um, engineering demand for it. And we, we the consumers, see that as uh, uh, power consumption. And in fact, perhaps the climate change as well. So um, that's the Moore's law, which really isn't a law. And now we're really hitting the limit. I mean, engineers have been predicting we'll hit the limit like real soon for the past decades, but then engineers keep coming up with workaround and so on. Um, at some point it's going to be like not possible. Um, basically, we, we are already very, very close to that uh, fundamental limit. So you're, you're squeezing in only like four or five atoms into this um, transistor which just breaks all the uh, uh, physics uh, fundamental law, unfortunately. Um, Daphne, let, 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 could, could you uh, help us out here and, and describe for us the, the, the basic kind of global ecosystem of, of chip supply? Because what, what, what strikes me as, as, as really unique, I suppose, is that you have these kind of big centers uh, of fragmentation so that the US is kind of central to the design of chips but doesn't do that many much manufacturing and and Taiwan does a lot of manufacturing but relies on US design and then the customers are elsewhere so it's a, it's a very interconnected ecosystem but can you can you just expand on that a bit yes absolutely it's it's as you said a very interconnected ecosystem and if anything that what the covid-19 pandemic has done or rather what this global shortage of chips has done is um, shed the light on uh, some of the vulnerabilities of this supply chain. Um, so as you mentioned, there are very many different uh, steps in the chip manufacturing process. Uh, there's the design and, and what's problematic at the moment is the manufacturing, uh, particularly the front end manufacturing. So the part of the process where the integrated circuit is printed on the wafer. Um, this process is um, incredibly complicated. It's up to 1500 steps. It's up to 300 different materials. Um, it's, uh, it's an incredibly complicated process. It can take in normal times up to 20 weeks, um, depending on the type of chip. Um, so this incredibly complex process has uh, historically been outsourced uh, by companies that aren't capable, don't have the capacity to produce the chips uh, that they use in their products themselves. Um, it's been outsourced mostly, mainly to two companies, Samsung and TSMC, who you've uh, mentioned before. So two uh, companies uh, are... Samsung and TSMC, right? Yes. Is that right? And one's based in Korea and one's based in Taiwan? Exactly, yes. Um, and so the result of that is um, that the vast majority of chip manufacturing is based in Southeast Asia. I think the exact figure is that three quarters of chip manufacturing cap capability at the moment is based in Southeast Asia. Um, what this means is that is that if there are uh, disruptions to this supply chain, whether it's from climate change, um, geopolitical tensions, a huge surge in demand, or in our case, all three at the same time, 
um, it might cause huge problems when it comes to supplying um, the, the, the amount of chips that are needed to build products that are chip intensive around the world. Um, so this is a problem that is intrinsic to the supply chain of um, chips specifically. And I think it's really something that has been brought to light uh, by this particular shortage. Um, nations and companies are increasingly um, understanding and realizing that they are incredibly reliant on a handful of companies for the supply of chips that are um, absolutely necessary and central to, um, to everyday products um, to the extent that we don't even notice them anymore. But um, we, we are now seeing the implications of that uh, shortage. So I think it's really brought that vulnerability to the, to the spotlight. Thank you. Jeremy, you've been in charge of Huawei in the, in the UK for, for, for a while now, for many, many years. And uh, I just wonder whether, before we get to looking at the causes of the, the global chip shortages as, as, as you see them, to take us back a couple of years, three years, when the supply chain was, was working well. What was the, where, where did Huawei sit in, in the global chip supply uh, and demand chain? And, and what was coming from America? And what was being made in, in Taiwan and, and how did China fit into it? Just, just give us a map of how things worked when they sure. did work. Sure. Um, so, as Daphne said, it, it's a um, hugely complex, globally integrated supply chain. Um, and uh, the different parts, different tools are done in different parts of the world. And, and actually, it sort of plays to the strengths of um, Taiwanese. Uh, manufacturing, uh, US design tools. Um, and here in the UK, you know, with our own arm, you've got some of the fundamental reference designs as well. Um, so there is a, um, a, a virtuous circle of, um, of collaboration uh, that was uh, built probably over the last 20 years or so. Um, and, and then um, we've had a few sort of geopolitical interferences which have come into play just at the time the uh, the chip industry is going through one of its sort of every four year cycles um, and and there's a sort of uber cycle every 10 years or so where there's sort of a little adjustment um, as you get in in, in any business um, so you know sort of floods and covid in taiwan uh, geopolitical interference from the us have completely disrupted uh, the the, uh, the market, and you know, in our own case in Huawei, um, we 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 no longer had access to some of the U.S. tools that were used in the design of of, of the chips that we use in some of our products, um, and the tools that are used in some of the manufacturing plants that may be in Taiwan, but they're using American tools. Uh, so that was majorly disruptive to, to Huawei and a few other companies, but actually it sent a, um, ripples through the whole industry. And, um, and regions of the industry realized that actually they are dependent on what was becoming an increasingly unpredictable US administration. And, and that was going to have major impacts on their own industry. So in the European Union, for example, they've allocated cash to invest in their own chip development capabilities. It's, it's not starting from fresh. There is some capabilities already here. Um, and likewise in China. So, so Huawei was a, a small player, made a virtue out of being part of this integrated global supply chain, uh, you know, calling on the specialists around the world, um, but now is having to you know, look at alternative um, uh, options in terms of the design of chips, um, the manufacturing of chips, and and you know along with others we might find ourselves more vertically integrated, not out of desire but out of necessity. Um, and if the whole industry goes that way and we become regionalized in the supply, now that could that could trigger a one trillion dollars of investment. Um, if each region in the world decided they wanted to be independent. Um, and that would have put between 35 and 65% on the price of uh, your, your average chip. It would take years to get to that point. But um, you know, as an industry, I think we owe it to ourselves to define how much we're gonna do regionally and how much we're gonna do 
um, as an integrated global supply chain. I don't think we'll go back to the fully integrated past, but it will be hugely disappointing if we end up in a totally fragmented, high cost uh, environment. Because as Daphne said, you know, to, to create these, these fabs, you know, we're talking about billions. Um, I think uh, the Taiwanese company has invested 30 billion um, in the next three to four years. I think similar from Samsung and Intel, you know, in the eight to 10, 10 billion. So, you know, this is a major disruption to one of the fundamental components of, of many, many industries. Um, and unfortunately, Huawei has, um, has suffered along with, uh, along with others. And why, I mean, historically, I'm just interested in why the industry has developed in the way that it has with there being such a separation between design on the one hand and manufacture on the other hand. I mean, wasn't Huawei kind of aware that this was a big potential risk even before it happened? And did, did the company take any steps to, to mitigate that risk? So, so first of all, you know, it, it is a risk for Huawei, um, but actually it's, you know, as, as has already been explained, you know, for the car industry, um, for, you know, electronics industry, um, you know, it's, it's a massive, in, it's an industry-wide issue. Uh, and and we, would, we would frame the issue as an industry-wide issue, somewhat triggered by, you know, health crisis, climate, uh, natural cycle. But the primary issue is, is the US actions and putting sanctions on certain companies, which are, you know, those companies like Huawei have reacted, but many other companies have also reacted and said, you know, we can't, we can't rely on this supply, so we need to think of it um, more more broadly. So um, yeah, sure, we knew about it, but we you know we made a virtue out of as um, every other organization. You know, if you're a you know a Bosch or a or a BMW, you know you don't really want to be making designing cars and the chips as well. Um, you know, in some cases like five G, we have to do that, but you know for general chips, you don't want to do that. Um, and we're, we're having to reconsider that whole strategy, which is enormously disruptive and expensive. Um, and, and that's why, you know, we, we, knew, we knew it was a risk, but we chose to take that risk. Um, and, um, and, you know, now, now we're, you know, if you like on plan B, but still open to doing business with the big, you know, the big players in our plan A strategy, if we're allowed to. No, thank you very much for that. It, it, I'm, I'm going to come back to, to Joe for a second because I, I see she has her, her yellow hand up. But, but first, I'm, I just want to turn to, to Rana um, because a, a, lo a lot of this uh, debate centers around uh, China and sanctions against China, and particularly uh, uh, Taiwan and, and China's uh, attitude towards, towards uh, Taiwan. I mean, it, it's right, isn't it, that tensions relating to Taiwan are, are rising. I think Admiral, Admiral Phil Davidson uh, from the US said that he was worried about an attack by, by 2027, Ch China invading uh, uh, Taiwan. I mean, how, what if the relationship between those geopolitical tensions and the kind of the technological tensions that we've, we've been hearing about? A no, really important question. I think we've had some fabulous viewpoints so far on this really important and complex uh, question. Uh, first of all, um, again, uh, I'm going to make like Jeremy and take a risk here by making a prediction. I actually don't think that an invasion of Taiwan in the sense of a military invasion of Taiwan is something that most people who look at the strategy of this think is very likely in the near future. I mean, you know, nothing is guaranteed in, the, in this world, but there are a variety of strategic reasons that I won't go into here, but they're you know easily findable as to why it would actually be pretty difficult, particularly as a sort of sneak attack, you might say, because you need to start sort of gathering troops on the, uh, you know, the, in the province of Fujian, you need to sort of get the PLA Navy on uh, all in place, you know, it would be very visible for a satellite and other means. So uh, all in all, um, it's, it's not the easiest of things to, to do. I've always thought and continue to think, and this gets to your question, that the question of the economic links between Taiwan and mainland China are probably much more central to the way in which this dynamic is going to work out in the in the near future. So let's get to the question of where the geopolitical tensions matter and how they link to technology. I would say that the one of the biggest game changers there has been in the last um, let's say 10 to 15 years, something like that, um, is the emergence of China 
as a major innovator in technology. I think even 20 years ago, people would not have classed China as a country that was producing really important, uh, disruptive, innovative technology. Now, on a whole variety of things that, you know, this particular gathering, I suspect, is more expert on than, than, than I am, everything from, you know, AI to nanotech and so forth. You know, we, I, I think those who are in the know will be aware that China is not, unlike some of the kind of hysterical headlines, ahead on absolutely every single technology compared to the West. But there are plenty of areas of uh, really uh, important advance where it is clearly uh, making, um, uh, making great strides. But the difficulty in that, as we already established, is semiconductors, which at the moment is not an area where China has high quality manufacturing or the capacity to do it, and therefore is, to its great chagrin, very, very dependent on the production of semiconductors in an island, which it also happens to want to uh, reunify through one means or another. So what's changed in terms of the situation? Well, I'd summarise in the following way, very happy for people to kind of, you know, push back uh, uh, against this. But I would say that both the United States and its allies and China, which doesn't really have allies, have got themselves into a situation by which the state and geopolitical policy is taking a much more central role in terms of the way in which the private sector and technology um, are combined with the state's overall goals. Um, that was less true in the United States and in the Western world, say 20 years ago at the height of globalization, which is when all these you know, international supply chains were really established. It was always somewhat true for China because China is a one party party state. It's, it's, not, it's not a liberal democracy. It's never particularly claimed to, 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 to be one. And industrial policy and strategy has always been seen as part of a wider project that goes way back to the late 19th century, in fact, of uh, Fu Guoqiang being a, a strong country and uh, a, a rich country and a strong army. But in this particular case, the uh, strategy, particularly under Xi Jinping in the last 10 years of wanting explicitly to make China a global actor, which it has a high level of ability to control its own destiny and also to spread geopolitical influence. Not, not I think, an actual China model. Uh, so in other words, this isn't like the old Soviet Union, but certainly strong international economic and security influence. And technology is a huge part of that. And of course, in China, while there is a large private sector, it's much more under the direct influence of the party state than is exactly the case in most liberal countries. And anyone who has seen what's happened recently to Jack Ma with Ant uh, Financial, or who's seen what's been happening to Didi Chuxiao, uh, the uh, Chinese ride company in the last few, well, week, in fact, last few days, will understand how the direct use of regulatory um, intervention has very much been put forward to make sure that, essentially put at its most basic, the party comes first. I mean, there's no secret about this. Xi Jinping said it to top volume uh, last week at the uh, 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party. The difference, though, is also, as well as this much more party state oriented um, use of technology and its uh, its, its prioritization as something that has to be indigenized and it's not vulnerable to the supply chain uh, difficulties that Daphne and others talked about earlier, is that of course the United States is now getting much more into that space as well. Of course there's not necessarily something new about that in the 50s and 60s, you know, we can think about the era of the early Cold War when Boeing, when um, Semiconductor in fact, uh, National Semiconductor and all sorts of companies like that were essentially part of an American unstated industrial strategy in which military usage and commercial usage meant that the state and private sector were actually interacting in some quite significant ways. The difference is that right now, I think there's much less embarrassment and oddly enough from both sides of the political uh, spectrum in the United States about actually saying the United States needs to do this again. And this is becoming a commoner and commoner um, statement amongst most of the US's allies that also have high capacity in technology, the United Kingdom. Uh, um, South Korea. Israel is an interesting one because actually Israel has quite strong relations with China in certain ways, but on technology issues, I think that the Americans are having some quite stern words with them. So to summarize that, I would say that overall, both China and the United States and its allies are moving to a direction where actually state and geopolitical tensions and priorities are going to have much, much, much more interaction with the way in which they think about technological production, innovation, protection of intellectual property and the vulnerability or otherwise of supply chains summed up in the word decoupling, which I think we've heard a great deal of. It's more language than reality at the moment. And as Jeremy said, it would take a very long time to actually implement in practice, but that is certainly the direction of travel in some very important areas.
Thank you. That's so so interesting. So much to think about. But but um, I mean, in, in relation to 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 the uh, to the U.S. action on uh, semiconductors, in in that respect, China is is responding to something that America has done, rather than implementing its own decoupling. Uh, I mean, is it? Does it have a? What kind of attitude does it have in respect of? responding to others actions rather than trying to implement its own actions does it does it come at well, us I, think, from the same I think most I, I think most american strategists wouldn't share that analysis alexi they would say that an awful lot of that technology is basically dual use it's military as well as civilian and so of course as much the american innovation the point is that that's invented in america and used there first and uh, first and first and foremost uh, in the particular issues that we're thinking about particularly machine learning uh, the way in which um uh, uh, voice recognition visual recognition, all these sorts of areas are, are being developed. Of course, they have very, very important consumer uh, uses as well, as well as the collection of big data. And you can look at the way in which Alipay and companies like that or um, applications like that have really taken off in, in China. But they also have, of course, incredibly important military uses too. I think there's no, no particular secret about that. And in that context, I think the United States would say, well, actually, the rising quality of China's military provision makes the position of the United States and its liberal allies in the East Asia region, South Korea um, uh, and Japan amongst them, much more vulnerable. And it would also point, of course, to the position of Taiwan, which is not a formal US ally and, of course, not recognized as a separate country, but is under the 1979 Taiwan Relations Act entitled to get support from the United States in terms of protection of its own autonomy. Uh, and so those are the areas which the United States would say that China has been chipping away at, if I may use a, a pun, and therefore, in that sense, it's the U.S.'s response to that, rather than the U.S. randomly putting um, sanctions on actions by, uh, you know, for out, out, out of a sort of sense of whim, whimsy. Ah, I see. Okay, thank you, Joe. Jo, you, you've had your hand up for for a bit. Can I bring you back into the conversation? Oh yeah, uh, sure. Um, I was just going to add some uh, numbers uh, to the point that Jeremy was trying to make that. Um, while you know, a certain sector or a certain company might foresee that they will have chip shortages and that is directly going to hit the supply chain. Really, you're talking about such big number for the investment that is, is really not for the faint hearted. So, so an example that I got was that uh, if you are going to build a new um, this sort of chip manufacturing facility and kit it out, it takes $10 billion. $10 billion, and it takes one to two years to do that. And then maybe another half a year to, to ramp up your production. So that time scale and the money involved and, and also completely disregarding the technical expertise that you have to gather. So if you are say like a, a car manufacturer, you're never gonna go into cheap manufacturing yourself, even though you know it's really essential uh, a component for, for your car. You have to, you simply have to rely on others because that expertise, that concentration on expertise is what makes it viable. Um, that there is no other way. That's all. Uh, and and, and do, you, do you think that that means that, that going forward, even if countries want to develop their own uh, chip manufacturing bases, that they'll, they'll in practice find it incredibly difficult to do so? I think some countries which have already got some ability, those will be the country that could expand, uh, obviously. But if you want to start from very little and get to a level that it will actually be profitable and not hugely losing you money every year, yeah, that's, it's, it's hard because there's the money that we talk about. So we're talking about tens of billions. So, uh, you know, a 10 billion, investment over two, five years, that's, that, that's nothing. That's not going to real, bring any real change. And then there is a time you need to wait for, wait for things to come into fruition. Uh, and there is expertise. Uh, the people that you need, these are highly skilled people. And electronic electrical engineering is not particularly popular for our UK uh, graduates, uh, to, to say the least. So there is a huge issue there as well. That's so interesting that you mentioned the, ta the talents component. I, I, I think I read a couple of days ago, I'll, I'll ask Jeremy about this in a, in a second, that, that Huawei actually have a chip manufacturing 
arm that, that, that retains and employs thousands of people and currently it's, it's, uh, it's operating at a loss, but, but it's being retained because of the overall, presumably the overall long-term strategic importance to, to, to the company. I, I want to come back to, to, to Daphne in a second because I she, she, see she has her hand up. Uh, but can we come first to, to Phil Porter, who's making a, a point in, in the chat uh, about uh, uh, politicians uh, withholding or controlling access to technologies uh, for, for a strategic advantage? Phil, are you around? Hi, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, okay. Um, what was the point? So uh, my point was, it, it certainly seems that, that uh, a few companies or a few, few states are trying to uh, withhold um, or control access to some parts of their technology to get an advantage. It's clearly happened with in the, in the United States, withholding access to the tool chains from Huawei, which your representative from Huawei was talking about. Um, so some countries are able to do that on the software side, on the tool side. Some, com some countries are able to do that on the manufacturing side. So Taiwan and Korea are in a strong position as a result of that. Now in the UK, we used to design, um, or we used to own the design of the microprocessors that uh, power almost all of our phones and, and some of our computers as well um, in Arm Holdings, um, which is based in Cambridge. Um, but that recently was sold into a, to a Japanese bank and is now also likely to be sold on to NVIDIA, an American company. And this kind of weakens the United Kingdom's position strategically to take any, any kind of control in this area. It might not have been advantageous for them to do so, but it certainly reduces their options, I think. And, and do, do, you, do, you, do you see a way of the, for the UK to come back from that position? Uh, is, it, is it possible that they can invest in, uh, in any chip manufacturer in, in, in a practical sense, or are there just too many barriers to that? I think there are too many barriers all over the place. The, the, it's been discussed, the cost of manufacturing is enormous, $10 billion or something to, to create a fab, but to create the cool tool chain, to allow engineers to design into those fabs takes a lot, a lot of man hours and a lot of time, even if the money isn't as big. And to create a new company like Arm is, is just basically impossible. I mean, it would, it would essentially involve like some sort of forced nationalization of a company which is going to be owned by an American company. We, we just couldn't do that. I see. It. Okay. Well, let, let, let's let's come to Daphne because I think that she has her her hand up. Um, Daphne, what, what do you want to say? Yeah, I just wanted to come back to Jeremy's point about um, the prospect of essentially countries ensuring self reliance when it comes to chip uh, manufacturing. Um, I don't. I don't. I might be wrong, but I don't think any country um, wishes to ensure self reliance when it comes to chip manufacturing. It's um, as as has been mentioned before, it's an extremely expensive process. And even if you did build lots of foundries, it's not just the foundries, it's the it's the design, it's the all the steps. It's it is a, a global process and it will probably remain a global process. But I do think that um, if you look at the recent um, US bill that unlocked $52 billion for chip manufacturing, this is more about ensuring self-reliance for key uh, critical sectors like telecoms or defense or um, basically national security. I think when, when the EU says that they want to, to reach a 20% state, 20% um, sorry, share in uh, the global manufacturing of chips, that's, that's also what they're saying. Um, I don't know if there is a country um, that is hoping to establish uh, complete self-sufficiency when it comes to chip manufacturing. And I don't think it's a realistic prospect. Um, rather countries are realizing that well, the, the COVID-19 crisis and the, the global shortage of chips has shed the light on the fact that um, if there is a shortage, um, countries are extremely vulnerable to the fact that they are reliant on a handful of companies to manufacture chips and they are looking at ways to make sure that they could ensure self-reliance for critical sectors, but I don't think they are looking at self-reliance as a whole and to build a homegrown uh, chip manufacturing industry uh, from A to Z. And, and just to be clear, Daphne, that, that critical sectors would include sectors like uh, defense, but not sectors like kind of consumer products like smartphones, is that right? I don't think so. No, I wouldn't think. I wouldn't think it would, inc it would include consumer electronics, but um, medical equipment, for example, defense equipment, telecoms, 
um, an, a number of highly sensitive uh, sectors that would require um, a sustainable, robust um, supply chain when it comes to, to semiconductors, I think. I think so, yeah. That's uh, that's that's really interesting, uh, Jeremy. Let's let's come back to to you if 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 we could. Uh, do you see this the the chips shortage as, as having serious uh, national security implications? I mean, I think quite a lot of people think of a lack of chips as maybe delaying consumer goods, delaying cars. But but how much is it about how important? is it to national security and how much is national security what countries will be thinking about when they decide what to do about chips um i, I guess it depends on how you define national security um the um i, I will i will answer your question but um you know the in, the us um considered bmw and canadian aluminium as security threats um because it was a threat to their economic prosperity um and i think Huawei is probably in that camp as well. So, um, you know, I think that, um, uh, you know, if BMW or, um, you know, Bosch can't make their, they're closing their factories because there's not enough chips, then that does have an impact on the, the economic uh, prosperity of the nation, but not necessarily, you know, security from a, a defense point of view. Um, so, so I don't think I don't think we're talking about um, you know the security of, of countries. Um, I think it's more about the economic security. Can I just come back on a couple of points, just very briefly? Uh, I, I totally agree with what Daphne said in terms of you, you know it is almost inconceivable, you know, possibly with the exception of the U.S. and China, of self-sufficiency um, in the supply chain, and and I don't think anyone really would welcome that. Um, um, so, so I, I think in, in, you know the European Union are, are will selectively invest in parts of that supply chain, and then and then another point that that Phil made uh, about um, the UK position, you know, as a Brit who's been in technology and a huge fan of what happens here, uh, you, you know, whilst we're talking about monstrous investments in order to get mass-produced fabrication units, you know, in the tens of billions, as Joe said. In, in order to um, you know, get the product to be in the manufacturing process, there is a whole load of other steps. Um, and you know, ARM is a really good example of that. Um, and you know, it's in about, I think, 80, 90% of the mobile or wireless devices in the, in the world. Um, so it's a, it's a global leader. Uh, but you know, a few years ago, uh, while we acquired a, a UK uh, activity uh, called Imp, uh, 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 IP, uh, what's it called? Um, Integrated Photonics. And, and it was a spin out from BT originally. And um, it came with some really core talent and, um, and, uh, and some patterns. And we invested in it and we've continued to invest in it. And, and it now actually designs optical chips, designs the optical chips for our products worldwide. Um, and that was based out of a kernel of capability and um, IP. So, so these, these sort of, if you like, um, this whole ecosystem, if appropriately invested, uh, has huge value. And the UK is pretty good at this stuff. Arm's an example, uh, integrated photonics is another. Um, you know, there are lots of good capabilities that can be invested and nurtured, um, you know, aside from huge fabrication um, manufacturing plants. We, we've been discussing with, with quite a few uh, UK businesses whether there are any upsides uh, to, to, to the pandemic in terms of uh, some of the innovation that they've been forced to develop, for instance, in the last uh, 18 months. And I just wonder whether you see, uh, Jeremy, an upside in, in what has happened uh, to, to, to chips and to chip supply in the sense that it, is there not an argument that greater chip self-sufficiency to some degree, if not completely, is actually a, a good thing for countries to pursue as an objective? Um, I think disruption uh, is, a, is a great stimulus for creativity. And we've had a massive disruption and there's a lot of creativity. People have, and companies are analyzing what, what they stand for, what they want to do. Um, I, I personally think um, 
the, uh, the, the, the where, where we are at the moment is, is the uncomfortable stage of that creativity. Um, as we're all identifying, you know, short-term, long-term solutions. You know, the short-term solution is stockpiling uh, and lots of companies are stockpiling. That's made the problem worse. Um, and, um, you know, what you can probably see in 2023, a surplus, um, uh, because with all the sophistication of our, our forecasting and planning, um, you know, with all the production investment that's going in at the moment, um, I, I think we'll have probably a surplus in, in the next cycle um, in sort of three to four years time. Um, so um, yeah, yes, there, there, there might be some good things coming out of this, um, but, um, but I, I guess we're in that uncomfortable phase right now, uh, at least some of us, um, as we're adjusting to the old, from the old world to the new world. Um, Daphne, let, let, let me ask you a question about whether we should actually be taking this seriously or not. Because uh, yeah, I think you wrote a, a, a story with the headline, a global chip, shortage, a global chip shortage is a much bigger problem than everyone realized and will go on for longer too. But what you just heard from, from, from Jeremy is that cyclically, even with all these problems, by 2023, we might even be seeing a, sh a surplus of chips. So, you know, if I have to wait another two months for my MacBook Pro or, you know, my PlayStation 5, and then in two years time, there's a glut, like, what is even the problem here? So, well, it's it's an interesting question. And um, I was writing today, actually, about um, a new headline that I saw recently about um, recent GDP, GDP uh, statistics uh, in the UK. And I feel like we've gone from a place where the global chip shortage was perhaps not niche, but only concerned people who were looking for a new laptop or a new PC. And now we're talking about it actually impacting economic growth because um, the decline in manufacturing of cars specifically is now affecting to a degree the UK's economic growth. Um, so I think we're really seeing the, the, the global shortage of chips trickling down to some parts of the economy that we didn't really see coming. Depending on who you speak to, I feel like experts are planning even more ahead than others. I have seen experts talking to me about um, smart farming, for example, smart farmers rely on chips for their um, for their smart farming instruments. Um, if we imagine that they won't be able to use smart instruments to calculate their crop yield, will that have an impact on the price of food? So that that might be considered a bit of a stretch, but what we are seeing at the, at the moment in the statistics is that it is impacting industries where we haven't seen particularly a surge in demand that like we have seen in PCs and laptops, uh, the car manufacturing industry being obviously the one um, uh, that, that is making a lot of headlines, but we're also seeing this in um, home appliances, microwaves, refrigerators, uh, smart home equipment, um, smartphones are expected to run into difficulties in the coming years because in the coming year rather because um, because there is a surge of demand that is expected as a result of 5G enabled phones uh, coming out. This being said, I think I just wanted to go back to what you were asking, which I thought was really interesting in terms of is this ushering in perhaps a new era, um, rethinking hardware manufacturing, rethinking uh, the way that we consume perhaps, and this might be thinking ahead too much, but I do think that we're already seeing electronics manufacturers rethinking their designs, rethinking uh, the way that they use chips. Will this maybe usher in a new era of um, less reliance on constantly upgrading smartphones and laptops? Uh, will we be moving towards a more sustainable supply chain when it comes to uh, using electronics? We don't know. Um, as Jeremy said, it's probably the uncomfortable phase right now, but I certainly hope that going forward, it might be the start of something more creative and perhaps uh, more sustainable as well. You know, talking of sustainability, I see I see in the in the chat uh, that uh, Shoshi uh, Yip has, has raised raised a, a question about how uh, the semiconductor crisis is related to, to, to raw materials like like steel and rare earths. Should, should we be? I think that she's in a library, which means that she can't come on to the camera. But let me ask her question for her. It is. Do you think that there's a there's a link between the semi? Should we be looking at the semiconductor industry through a sustainability lens as well as a technological innovation lens? I definitely think so. Um, I think um, if we look at the at the upgrade cycles of 
smartphone manufacturers, for example, like Apple, they are expected to upgrade their smartphones um, every X months, every year, potentially. Um, and they are looking for consumers. They're, they're looking to lure consumers in. They're looking for consumers to upgrade their smartphones. At the moment, this is potentially causing a problem because every consumer wants to upgrade to their iPhone 12 to get 5G next year. Um, is it time to think about not necessarily having upgrade cycles in the way that we know them today, but moving towards designs that are more sustainable or even the upcycle or recycle um, e-waste. That's that's also something that could be useful in this in the current context. I don't think that the technology exists today to to go and fetch old chips from um, e, from from e-waste. Um, e-waste or, or to get e-waste components and recycle them into brand new components but um is it worth thinking about uh, devices that might be designed in a way that doesn't require constant upgrade and constant um constant renewal of, of the raw materials that go into it and that might be relatively damaging to the environment um, I, I would like to come to to, to, to Rana in a second, uh, and then to uh, Yelena, who's making a great point in the chat about electric vehicles. But but on that sustainability point, Joe, jo, can I just ask you, as a, an expert on how semiconductors are actually put together, how sustainable is the industry, and should we be worried about about it from a sustainability perspective? So I guess it depends on uh, which aspect we are looking at. So uh, I think some some of the chat is talking about like raw material. So uh, in the case of silicon, um, your raw material is like the sand. So um, there is an abundance of that um, in there. So that part of it is fine. But then obviously there are some other parts of the semiconductor manufacturing. Um, requiring uh, more toxic um, materials, such as the one that I work on, very unfortunately, there's arsenide and things, so on things in there. So we have to be very careful. Uh, but th those are much, much smaller. They are, they are in very small scale compared to the sort of uh, chips that we talk about, which is mainly using silicon. Um, but in terms of the manufacturing, uh, it is quite energy uh, intensive because you have to maintain this uh, environment, you know, for the humidity, for the temperature, and all this material has got to be like super pure. And so they, they all have to go through multiple processes just to go from that raw material into something that is pure enough to be used. And if any steps goes down, so, so people are very scared to make changes. You, you got to sort of like overspec to make sure you actually hit that target. So in, in that regards, it, it kind of is energy intensive. Uh, I'm not sure there's an easy way for the industry to change quickly. But of course, industry do pay attention to the bills. So I, I would think that most likely if there are ways to you know, cut down the usage of cooling water, electricity, then most likely they would have had engineers uh, working on it. But it's not to say that improvements can be made. I'm just saying that there probably isn't some low hanging fruits for you to just simply uh, implement and say, half the bill next year. Okay, uh, let, let's turn back to, to, to Rana. I, I, I'm not sure that you want to make a point about sustainability, but please make, make, make the point that you want. Um, it's not directly about sustainability in the way that we've just been discussing it, but in a sense it bounces off it because I think that these questions and all the others just cannot anymore be viewed without looking them through the lens of how the divergence between uh, the United States and its allies and China is, is going to go. I think in a sense we were given a bit of a sort of free pass of interpretation for four years when Donald Trump was in the White House because he was so anomalous in various ways that he had appeared that he was a sort of disruption to the global order, a normal service would be resumed. But I think it's very clear that in many ways he reflected a set of changes that have actually you know clearly um, continued to, to, to grow. Essentially the world of 10, 15, 20 years ago in which China was, uh, well China was committed to an authoritarian system which nonetheless was genuinely globalized and integrated into various aspects of the, of, of the wider world, including the WTO, and one where the United States was geopolitically confident and actually was not bothered about these sorts of vulnerabilities in, in, in supply chains or sustainability. That world has gone and is not coming back anytime soon if it comes back, uh, comes back at all. For that reason, I think that 
any of the discussions we've been having, all of which are immensely important and relating to issues such as environmental sustainability, rare earths and so forth, can only really, I think, be now seen in the context of two really powerful hegemonic actors, the United States and China, which have highly indigenizing agendas when it comes to these essential technologies and the, the supply chains and the, the philosophy behind those supply chains of just a few years ago is gone and I don't think it's coming back. Well, what, what, what do you, can I ask you a kind of bold question about, about China's technological ambitions? Well, I mean, I, I, in, my, in my research for this, they, they, they produced a five-year plan, I think in, in March this year, which yeah. emphasized technological innovation. They right. want to get to 70% self-sufficiency in semiconductors by 2025. A, how uh, realistic do you think that ambition is? And B, what are their, what are their goals? What are their objectives? Um, on the first one, how uh, plausible it is, I mean, other people here, including Joe and others, will know more about the semiconductor specific, although my sense is that they're quite some way off from being able to produce the kind of high quality semiconductors that are being produced in uh, uh, in Taiwan. And by the way, another reason there wouldn't be an invasion of Taiwan is that I think the first target for sort of self-defense would be to blow up, the, uh, blow up the semiconductor factories. So I think that would certainly be a, a setback to industry around the world, to, uh, to, put it, uh, to put it mildly. In terms of overall goals, uh, China essentially has expressed this in terms of what it calls its dual circulation economic policy, which is at the heart of the five-year plan, which is the idea that there should be as much domestic economic growth as possible uh, oriented through consumption while maintaining a very high export capacity. You don't have to be a particularly sophisticated economist to know that actually these things are not compatible with each other. If you basically want to increase spending power for domestic consumers, you need to put more spending power in their pocket and doing that at the same time as driving very, very high exports isn't possible to, uh, to do. So it's a political statement rather than an economic one, but the direction of travel from that is very, very clear. China wants to be in a position where it's as invulnerable as possible. It goes back to the old Maoist idea of zili uh, you know, self-reliance. Um, as invulnerable as possible in terms of its domestic economy. COVID is a bit of a gift, of course, because it means that getting you know, awkward people coming in and out uh, physically is, is much harder at the moment, while maintaining the position it's had for a very long time of a very, very powerful exporter. The problem is that beyond a certain point, these things, A, are not compatible with each other economically, and B, the rest of the world has some thoughts about this too. And China so far has not been very effective at being able to place its own economic aspirations, many of which are perfectly reasonable, in the context of understanding how the rest of the world sees them. I'd like to bring, bring uh, Jeremy in in a, in a second to talk about innovation and the impact of innovation uh, that the chip crisis is having. But, but on a related point, I think Yelena is making a, a, a good point in the chat about uh, specifically the, the, the impact on cars and electric vehicles. So if, if Yelena is around, um, can you Hello. make that point? Hi. Cool. Um, yeah, I'm really interested in what Ron is saying, um, but kind of looking at it from a more UK perspective, I'd like to understand more how this plays into the rise of gigafactories and electric vehicle production in the UK, um, especially because that's being led by so many businesses that are from across Asia, whether it's Hyundai and Nissan. And I wonder whether that's endangered by the current context of this. So like reading about, for instance, the Japan, um, uh, reading about the Nissan factory that's coming obviously to Sunderland and the gigafactory plans, it was interesting that the UK car industry, at the same time, there was a report about how it's set to lose something like 100,000 jobs without these kind of gigafactories. And in my mind, I was immediately thinking, OK, well, why are we relying on so much external investment in order to prop up our domestic manufacturing industries and economies? I don't think it's any coincidence at all that it was exactly the same week as the Batley and Spen by election that Johnson then appeared in Sunderland talking about the factory as basically electric um, election pork barreling. Um, so I really do think that we should also consider these phenomena through the lens of, of Johnson's so-called Indo-Pacific tilt, and, and therefore given the dependence of electric vehicles and these manufacturing industries on these chips, I want to know more about how exactly de developed Johnson's policy is and whether it will be economically sustainable as well as environmentally. Um, you know, are you, are you, are you worried then about uh, the UK getting into a position where we're increasingly reliant on chips and therefore increasingly reliant on 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 external nations and, and what happens to them is that is, are you saying that that's going to create an instability? 
Um, I'm not concerned about that per se, because I think we've always had global supply chains and actually I think the most resilient supply chains are those that depend on a mix of both domestic and international goods. So that in itself doesn't surprise me. And I just think kind of to echo what Daphne said earlier, this whole situation has really just exposed the fact that the microchip um, industry really is a set of just-in-time supply chains so actually we just need to be more transparent and um and developed in our industrial policy but that requires transparency so that's why i'm saying i would like to know more exactly what um factory investment okay, here manufacturing jobs here what that investment entails in the long term Okay, you, you cut out a tiny bit there, but I'm gonna I'm gonna flip back to to, to Jeremy, and I noticed that we're, we're we're coming to the end of the session. So, um, but but I really want to hear from 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 you, Jeremy, in terms of what you think the the, the consequences are of what is happening now uh, uh, for for innovation. For innovation, I guess in the short term, um, you know, organisations such as ourselves and many many others are are in the um, Sort of business continuity management part of it you know what do we need to do to stay alive um, and to manage this risk um, and and that means that uh, you know we're, we're reaching out to new partners um, and trying to along with many many others uh, support a, a parallel ecosystem of you know European and Asian uh, developers so it's, I think it's a pretty good time for um, you know, smaller companies looking to uh, grow rapidly in this because the demand is there and the supply has been disrupted. So, so uh, um, you know, if you're a European um, supplier in any part of the supply chain, um, now is a good time to reach out, or you've probably already been approached by the the uh, Asian or I should say non-American um, organisations to nurture that supply. Um, because you know the point we're making earlier on about investments in the UK, this is you know we've made a virtue out of sort of foreign investment and integrated supply, and and that will continue. Um, and and so, where is it going to go for innovation? I think it's a good time for the smaller companies looking to become bigger, bigger, because a, a whole raft of really excellent suppliers from the US are no longer available to some of the biggest markets. Um, they've chosen to do that, um, but it's it's good for innovators. Huawei and you know other organized tech companies cannot fill that gap themselves. It has to come through the supply chain. Um, so I think there will be innovation in the supply chain. I think there will be uh, opportunities for um, everything from you know design tools, manufacturing tools, even manufacturers um, and, and capabilities will be nurtured and, and developed. And, and, and do, you, do you think that you know as we go forward, the world is going to sort out the balance that it wants between the interconnectivity of the supply chain and self-sufficiency? Or do you think that divergences are going to get worse before they get better? Um, I, I think... Um, as, as one of my old bosses said, you, you sort of get the supply you deserve. Um, you know, I think we 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 if we work together um, as an industry, I think we can avoid investing that one trillion of duplicate investment, essentially, which will be inefficient and increasing the cost of chips by between thirty-five and sixty percent. Um, so I don't think that worst-case scenario will happen. Um, I think that there will be some regionalization, some more specialization and greater competition uh, in the supply chain, which is probably probably a good thing, a good thing for, for everyone. But as I say, I think we're in that uncomfortable stage at the moment as we're transitioning. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for coming uh, tonight for what is, uh, has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. I, mean, I don't know about you, but I, I can't think of a story that is both uh, as small and as big as this one. I mean, on the one hand, it's about whether I get a MacBook Pro with a 14 inch screen or a 13 inch screen next month. And on the other hand, are you thinking about that too, Rana? And, and on the other hand, you know, it's about what Rana said about a, a fundamental realignment in the relationship between the, the, the US and, and China. And in between all of that, you've got um, huge companies like Huawei 
uh, that 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 are in in survival mode as a result of of, of sanctions. You've you, you've got national security implications of the sale of companies like uh, Arm. Uh, it it really is the definition of a global story, and it's going to be one that that Tortoise keeps on keeps on looking at. So if anyone on the call has any ideas about how we should uh, go after this story uh, and, and where we should put journalistic resources, just email me. I'm on alexi at tortoisemedia.com. Uh, but, but for now, uh, it just uh, remains for me to say thank you so much to Rana, to Daphne, to Joe, to Jeremy, uh, to Phil, to Helena, to everyone that commented in the chat and um, have a great evening and see you soon. Thank you.